When Donald Trump wants a wall around our southern border, it's considered racist. All right, so before I even get to the next point, like, I understand this perspective, um, especially when we look at it from the perspective of uh, things just starting in 2016 of Donald Trump talking about a wall. I never thought that a wall was necessarily the best idea. I think that it was highly, the cost was highly under projected. What did they say, $5 billion? When like estimates that I saw um, were upwards of 80 billion plus and it would have taken like 10 years to complete. Uh, there were so many factors that weren't included, but I don't think that it was a racist idea. I understand he said some insensitive things about Hispanic people, but uh, generally speaking, he was keeping those towards gangs. Um, so, like, yeah, it's a little silly that the liberal narrative kind of deconstructed him and didn't give him any credit. They didn't attempt to contextualize what he was saying. They did whatever they could to force a particular value onto his words that fit their narrative. But domestic terrorists who take over a six by six block in Washington is considered patriotic. Again, the more, I mean, this is like, you know, obviously anti, uh, you know, rioting and uh, rhetoric. I get it. I totally get it. The problem is, is that the amount of word usage, nobody, nobody's like, yeah, this is patriotic. The thing with the whole Chaz situation is they're not championing themselves as patriots. They're championing themselves as like anti-government, anti-police forces. And to say that it's patriotic is using intentional, uh, like, you know, trigger words to rile people up into agreements. Like, yeah, no, that's not patriots. It's like, no, it's not. But nobody's saying it is except for her. And that's like a big problem. It's a complete misrepresentation of her argument in general, just to rile people up on her side. And this is this content is for her base. And this is a big issue with everybody on both sides. They're constantly making content for people, their own people. They're more worried about people saying like, I agree with this rather than putting out the truth and actually getting somewhere. Joe Biden is allowed to blackmail the president of Ukraine, but when Donald Trump asks about it, that's an impeachable offense. So, like the, the whole the whole Joe Biden. I mean, I'm going to get into this. This is I the, the Joe Biden situation is very. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to give too much value to the conspiracy theory, but I do understand uh, the curiosity in trying to figure out what actually was going on with the situation. The problem here that I have with it was the time. If Donald Trump was elected and he said, you know, there's something going on with, uh, you know, the, uh, Joe Biden with the Ukraine, I would have said, like, OK, I get that. That's a, this is a perfect, you know, you were a president and now you have an issue. The problem was he didn't give a shit about this situation uh, until Biden said, hey, I'm running for president. All of a sudden he was putting in so many resources to look into the Ukraine. And like, it's, it's silly. And like the fact that you're not acknowledging that to me, that says that like it is a conspiracy theory because Trump didn't give a shit about it until he felt like he needed to give a shit about it. That's my biggest thing. And it's a very big misrepresentation of the facts. People don't really include the timing in on the situation. A $5 billion border wall is apparently too expensive. Again, like there are projections up to like 80 to hundred billion dollars and the amount of time it would take to actually complete this would make it not worth it. We have technology that is incredible. So to do this as a way of, of reducing immigration seems silly. I mean, like, will they figure out ways to get in the country? Probably. Um, honestly, I don't know. It probably, it might help. It may or may not help, but how long is it gonna take? We could use technologies. We can just increase border funding in general. But like, honestly, at the crux of the issue is the fact that these Central and South American countries are treating their people like shit and we're giving them money as it is. So why aren't we talking about making them use the money correctly? Instead of a wall, a wall is a bandit over a bigger problem. But a one point five trillion dollar free healthcare system is apparently achievable. People Listen, I mean, hell, what? First of all, it works in other countries. Um, it, it does. It works in other countries. Universal healthcare works. I don't like Bernie Sanders' plan for universal healthcare. I will say that the projections from the Koch brothers study had said that it was actually cheaper than our current system. The problem is, is that that and I'm going to you know give conservatives a, a, a little bit of ammunition, but that was uh, based on Bernie Sanders' like purely positive, very generous projections. It would probably cost us more money. But the added economic value, in my opinion, of having some kind of a system where everybody has their own insurance, I think is a, is a drastic positive. I don't really care, and I do care, but like I don't really care that it helps everybody necessarily. I do, but what I'm more focused on is the fact that if you did some kind of universal health care, and I believe in opening up the, private, uh, the public market, but maintaining a private insurance option as well. If you opened up uh, Medicare for All, that is a massive boost to small businesses because small businesses no longer have to worry about bullshit Obamacare. Um, 
regulations. But on top of that, they also don't have to worry about paying people. And so like I look at Medicare for all uh, or some version of it as a direct boost to small businesses. And people don't really look at that. And I don't know why you're weaponized, why you're so mad that people for wanting to give other people health care, because it's not just poor people like give me health care. It's people like myself. You know, why not? Why? Why not? put a, a bit more of a step stool on your ability to achieve more in America. We have this idea that we need to go through these drastic amounts of suffering to overcome it. But if you give somebody a little bit more of a leg up, I believe that it would give us a similar result. People who never owned slaves have to pay reparations to people who never were slaves. I, I mean, that one is a good point. I think that uh, reparations is incredibly, incredibly divisive. I'll give her credit on that. It's a very divisive idea to give out reparations. And the reality of the situation is that 85% of the country is non-black and 85% of the country will not support reparations. Also, and, I, and, and this isn't really politically correct, but reparations is not going to address uh, particular cultures in very black communities that have been created and generated by systemic oppression. Cultures that advocate for not going to school, living off of the welfare system and committing crime out of necessity to make money. And so like just giving people money isn't gonna help. You need to not only generate, put raw dollars into communities, but you also need to address these other issues because they're very real issues and they're actually like true. And this is one of the reasons why I'm against putting uh, more money into poorer areas when it comes to education, because education breeds personal value and opportunity, but it doesn't breed community value and opportunity. You need to have money into an area before people uh, go to that area. There's a lot of people that I, I, I live in a very robust state. There's a lot of people I work with that aren't formally educated. They're like, you know, they just migrated here. A lot of people from El Salvador, very hardworking people. They make good money because they know a particular trade, but they're not formally educated. They don't even speak English perfectly. And that's not a criticism. My point is, is that you don't need to be formally educated to have opportunity. If you funnel money into a poor area and you get them to build themselves up first, they can vote on property tax increases to increase their own education after. I'm not allowed to cheat to get into college because I'll go to jail, but if I cheat to get into this country, I get free everything. Uh, I'm assuming she's, I don't really know. I think she's talking about the Hollywood thing. I don't really know. I mean, she kind of has a point, I guess. I don't know if you go to jail for cheating to get into college. I mean, that seems a little hyperbolic to me. But I will say that, um, yeah, no, there's a level of truth to a lot of these countries, or countries, rather these states, um, these sanctuary cities that are, are doing as much as possible to advocate for illegal immigration and illegal immigrants that are here. If New York, for instance, uh, passed a bill that allows, or you know, a law that allows uh, illegal immigrants get driver's licenses. And it's like, you know, I understand the idea that you get them insured, you get them paying for it, but it really does nothing more than promote the idea that illegal people, people that are illegal should be here more. Um, and, it, and, and just for context, it's, it's important to uh, point out that most people that are here legally are here on overstate visas and things of that nature. They don't really come across the southern border. Uh, but still, I understand this perspective. People who never went to college have to pay for kids who made stupid choices and decided to go, go to college. Okay, so this point, this is like a really complex, maybe not complex, but this is a, this is a point that needs to be deconstructed. I understand what she's saying about the idea of people going to college and getting fucked, right? Um, what we need to put into perspective here is that we had a culture, and we continue to have this culture, that tells people they need to go to school. They need to go to school, they'll figure out what you want to do in life. It's terrible advice. Uh, I'm 30 years old, and I'm just figuring out what I want to do with my life, right? It takes a while. My advice to you is to look for a job that pays for your hobbies if you don't have a passion in anything. That's, that's it. Look for any job. Go get a trade. But there's also another half to this issue. It's the fact that uh, schools are so incredibly expensive. And if you look at how expensive they become over the course of like 10, 20, 30 years, they become, they become so much more expensive, but the value that you get from school has barely gone up at all. And they're taking a lot of this money and it's going into administration, uh, administrative costs for these schools to help better recruiting and to like smooth things out, but it's not worth the cost. And so, um, you know, there's the problem here is like, there's an issue and the issue is how much we've been subsidizing. Uh, we, you know, the, the, the government's been subsidizing schools to such a degree without any regulation that they've gone off the rails and they're charging so much. And so what we need to do is we need to get those administrative costs in line while at the same time, implementing some kind of a 10 for 10 program that would be you pay 10% of your income for 10 years and you are absolved of your debt, something like that. But it's outrageous. It is an issue. And if you look at it, like, I understand though, I do get what she's coming from, but it's still a problem. And it was because 
the government decided to just give out unregulated amounts of money to schools. We're hatching and releasing criminals because apparently it's an infringement on their right. I'm not- I don't know what she's referencing. I'm going to assume the only- I don't know what she's talking about. The only thing I could come up with is catch and release here. And like literally, um, that is directly- it stems directly from people seeking asylum. They'll come in, they'll catch them. Um, they'll put them through the system, and then they'll release them to come to a court date later on. If I was going to make this point in context, I would say I think only about 75% of the people actually show up to the court date that they're supposed to show up to. And that simply is, you know, not, I mean, it's unacceptable. There needs to be a restructuring. But this is, she's making such a generalized point that it seems like we have this issue in America where, like, we're crashing criminals and just releasing them. And so it's like, very ignorant. Not allowed to purchase a firearm, but you're totally allowed to go purchase drugs, alcohol, and get an abortion. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the point of this one is. I mean, like, yeah, there are states with like heavy firearm regulation, and like, I believe in like extending uh, gun usage, but like, I don't know how that's relevant to the other things. I mean, the only drugs you can purchase legally are alcohol um, and any prescription medication. So technically you're not allowed to purchase the drugs. You're not like, Hey, go get some drugs. Like, no, it's not legal to purchase drugs. Um, it's just as illegal to purchase drugs as it is, it is to purchase an illegal firearm. I don't really understand what the fuck she's talking about. Um, as far as the abortion thing, that's just like a personal preference. Um, I wouldn't call people even I'm pro-choice, but whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, I would, uh, tell you not to demonize the person that you don't agree, agree with and in here there's a heavy subtext that she's demonizing people and she's equating drug users to people who get abortions and it's very silly and it's very hyperbolic and it's very intentionally divisive irish and german scientists and engineers have to go through a very serious vetting process before being admitted into the united states but immigrants from our southern border get to come in whenever they want i don't i didn't know the first part <laughs> i don't know but again, this is an issue of, of, of the asylum-seeking process. This is the problem, is that when we look at the asylum issue, we look at it in very, a very binary way. We either look at it as we should take all these people in or should we should keep all these people out. In my opinion, the true issue on the way that you deal with um, asylum seekers is first and foremost, why are they leaving the country? Um, mostly it's economic, but it's also because of such an oppressive government and an oppressive um, gang-centered governmental system. And that's why they're leaving. Um, and so why not deal with that problem? You know, we walk we walk through Iraq in like 30 days. And like, what's stopping us from potentially walking through Central or Southern America? Or uh, or at the very least, saying like, hey, listen, we give you this much money. You need to start repurposing it correctly. And I would say that because there's no oil. <laughs> there's no oil there. And like, you know, it's just so intentionally hyperbolic. I think that there's definitely an asylum-seeking issue. I understand that. I agree with that. But this isn't really pushing forth. Uh, some kind of a solution. It's just kind of championing divisive rhetoric. When All right, so that was the end of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's the end of that.